Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Sunday sit. Glad to be back with everybody again. Good for yeah. Yeah. Glad to be back with all of you again. <laughs> Low party. <laughs> God. Okay. Hey, Rebecca, Allison, Kathy. Wow. It's so good to see you all. Yay. Robert, Bridget. Wow. Shalane. Kyoto. <laughs> Kyoto. <laughs> wow. So many places. Wow. So many places. Wow. So fast. Okay. Oh. Karen. Hi, everybody. <laughs> So many time zones, so many places. It's it's amazing, really. <laughs> Carrie, you're always on the beach. Right. <laughs> James, hi. Wow. Huh. BC, New South Wales, Hawaii. Wow, yeah. Oh. Well, whenever you're ready, Michelle. No, oh, you're re you're next. <laughs> whenever yeah. you're ready. Jesse, That's right? Fine. You're the Yeah, I think we're good. We're right. people the trickle has started to slow and so yeah, we'll <laughs> we can mute ourselves and Steve will lead the instructions this morning or this afternoon or this evening, evening. wherever you are. And um, Michelle will offer a talk and I'll take the lead on some questions and we will take it from there. So yeah, Steve, thanks. I'll give it to you. beginning by taking in your immediate environment. The visual palette of colors, the soundscape. Any fragrances, flavors, body sensations that you might notice from feeling your posture, however you're practicing in the f cushion, chair, your bed, your sofa. How does the body feel from within the body, not from the head or not from thoughts about your posture or about your experience? What's the direct connect? Textures, soft, hard, smooth, rough, grainy, light, heavy, warm, cool. Micro movements, larger, 
arcs of movement. And the smallest vibrational pulsation or stream. Primarily being body-based, you'll find is one of the strengths of anchoring in the present moment. And above all else, as long as there's a sense of the present moment, everything else is okay. Because we're not adding any weight of attachment, expectation, wanting experience to be different, changing, fixing. Rather, we've pretty much, for the time of our meditation, internalized our external environment into an inner landscape. And the understanding comes is pretty quickly following from anchoring in the present, using the body or using the breath, using sounds, that awareness synced with experience, that is mindfulness attuned to whatever's appearing right now, creates a spaciousness, relaxation, an atmosphere of true connection and exploration of that moment's experience. Even if it passes so quickly, we don't even know what it was. It hardly even leaves a trail. We don't need to know. If a thousand times we keep returning to the body, to the breath, to this moment, that's a thousand times that we're deepening our practice. This mindfulness muscle. Should we be aware that we've lost some moments of that pure mindful awareness that doesn't identify or want anything or need anything to be different? Then awareness of that gap is illuminating to know when mindfulness is and to know when mindfulness isn't. That is wisdom. So when it's present, there has to be a degree of wisdom and to have the wisdom to know that mindfulness was just absent for some noticings or some time or some moments, minutes. This is rich. This is what deepens our practice. It's not a mistake. There's nothing that shouldn't happen. There's nothing that happens that is, is not included in the domain of our awareness, which is the body and the senses, our entire experience of the universe. If, you're, if your anchor is the breath, notice when we do not bear down on it, force the breathing to attain a certain rhythm, slow it down, speed it up. When we just do not interfere with the breathing at all uh, and allow the breathing to breathe itself, in the same way, that subconsciously we allow the body 
the bodily functions to just follow their own nature, their own way. So all the physical and psychic, neurological, vascular, respiratory, all the systems just have an innate knowing of their own to keep the body bright, present, to correct error if it goes off. The same way, the same approach with the heart mind. It's natural for thoughts to arise, mental states, emotions, some clear, some in clusters, some vague, some painful, some light and bright, all of them either pleasant or unpleasant or neutral. It's the nature of the mind, other causes and conditions, mostly through the physical senses contribute to why certain emotions arise in a certain way at certain times, or a thought, or thought stream. So part of that reclaiming the present, that 1,000 times, is being okay with thought stream, emotions, mental states. Every time we feel that present time awareness, you'll discover less and less entanglement with the, the mental jungle of thoughts and memories, projections and planning. And gradually like the storm that turns in the sea, and the ocean chop becomes smoother and the waves longer lines and gentler as they move across the same way in the, the ocean of the mind. Turbulent systems come and go and it can feel like chop or chaos. But as soon as we have a, a handle of the present moment, kind of recognize, oh, this is just thinking. It's just mind state. It's just excitement, anxiety, fear, confidence. Whatever it is, the, the wake becomes smoother. The chop gives way to these longer lines of movement across the more clear and still, the still waters of the mind at rest. And this uncertainty or doubt that arises How does that feel in the body? Are there sensations that reflect or correlate the quality of that doubt, that uncertainty? The disturbance. If we can feel the sensations that correlate as we feel them, with awareness, sense, sense them and know them directly, not through the intellect, just the direct knowing, feeling, sensing. The disturbance will gradually fade, be more in the background, no thought or expectation that they disappear entirely. 
allowing them to follow their own nature the same way we allow the breath to breathe itself and the bodily systems to follow their elemental natures. Regardless of what's predominant when it arises, we can sink awareness to anything we intend. So if we do come up against an, a wall, an impasse, a difficult state, if that stuckness arises, it's okay to reattune. say to a neutral anchor, like the hands sound, opening the eyes a little bit, light. If the intention is to sustain balanced energy and awareness, not to avoid or push away, then we can focus as we choose and rest the awareness where we want. Also not fearing the chaos. Sometimes the energy and confidence are there for the difficult mind state or emotion, just making space for it kind of growing the room, the capacity, the compassion to feel and hold whatever, whatever is arising, however unpleasant. You'll notice if you just connect with and are aware of unpleasant, It's vastly different than aversion or ill will. How we know that, wisdom tells us that when, when we're aware of unpleasant, the object that is experienced as unpleasant is okay. And in the same way, when we become aware of pleasant, Wisdom shows us how vastly different that pleasant sensation or happy mind state is vastly different than attachment to the pleasant sensations, happy mental states. Herein lies freedom. See for yourself.
in the last minutes of the meditation. A suggestion is to to call up one of the the first three of the Brahma Viharas, all of which have a pleasant feeling tone. So if it's just a general desire for friendliness, connection, an attitude of being open, call up the metta, universal, unconditional loving kindness. Feel it in the heart center and just allow it to follow its own metta intelligence. If there's any kind of pain happening in your life or in the moment, physically, emotionally, mentally, the compassion is a great connector, soother, space holder for that pain that fear, that anxiety, that stress. We know it's compassion because it, it has a pleasant feeling tone. I care for this pain, whether it's your own another's, the world's, I care. The emphasis on the pleasant nature of the emotion of caring. And if you're feeling uplifted, happy for yourself, for the goodness, and good works of others. To feel the appreciative joy for their goodness, their well-being, their happiness. May the happiness and goodness and beauty continue as it is. Once, once you've chosen the Brahma Vihara, if you like, side by side with that Brahma Vihara, the metta, the compassion, karuna, empathetic joy, mudita, side by side, call up equanimity. and feel the emotion of that stability, the emotion of that part of our heart that no matter what's happening, remains centered, still, supported by Mahakruna, great compassion and liberating wisdom, upeka, to look upon things as they are.
the sound of a bell with no sound. Michelle's going to offer a Dhamma talk today. Yeah. <clears throat> That's a nice segue between um, the vipassana and uh, understanding the difference between being caught and I identified and being free and the Brahma Viharas. It's um, I think that you all know that we emphasize both the the love and the wisdom practice, and we try to. Um, help us all infuse our practice uh, with both that, the fragrance of love and wisdom. Uh, being, being home and not traveling teaching um, is just getting more, uh, to me, astonishing because I, since 1980, I think one or two, I've never been, um, home for this long and this year uh, I planted some zinnias not that many I live in the desert but I planted three zinnias and have never had them um, in my life before and uh, one of the flowers came last week and there are these beautiful petals the one flower is orange one's um, lavender one's purple but each of them has an inner center of like these gold stars like gold star flowers like very small in the in the around the um around the middle not the middle so these there's these beautiful petals and then it's like a lay you know like in hawaii a lay of flowers but the flower actually has a lay of flowers around the center and it felt like such a um powerful um, metaphor and somehow it seems to have led me to a few other um, beautiful metaphors that I wanted to share and one one is um, where I live on the big island there there's a mountain called Mount Akea and it's known as the tallest mountain in the world from the from the ocean floor and next to it is Mount Aloha, the largest mountain in the world by mass. And where I live, I can walk up to a certain place and look out at them. And recently uh, went up to 8,000 feet on Mount Akea, where uh, some people are trying to restore the dry land forest there. So I don't know if most of you know that a lot of the environment and Hawaii uh, was decimated and the dry land forest uh, was pretty decimated. At first they brought in uh, mouflon sheep and then cows. And um, so there's this one little teeny patch that is uh, protected. And there's a tree called Mamani, Mamani trees that have these beautiful yellow flowers. And then there's one bird, the palila bird left. It's endangered, but it only lives in this one patch because it eats the Mamani pods. So we went up there and um, we heard a story of in the old days that where I live, you could look up at the mountain and it would look like there was a whole lay surrounding the mountain of these mamani flowers, these beautiful yellow flowers. And it, 
I felt like, oh, here's this beautiful zinnia and then this story of how it uh, used to be. And I feel like the um, Vipassana and the Brahma Vihara practices are like the, these lays of flowers that we can't always see in someone, but that they, um, they provide like an oasis and a fragrance of peace and loving kindness that that can really make us weep with rejoicing when we when we meet up with it it's like um, it's that important it, it's like it saves our life to know that's possible This is from Mary Oliver. It's a poem called When I Am Among the Trees. When I am among the trees, especially the willows and the honey locusts, especially the beech, the oaks, and the pines, they give off such hints of gladness. I would almost say that they save me and daily. I am so distant from the hope of myself in which I have goodness and discernment and never hurry through the world, but walk slowly and bow often. Around me, the trees stir in their leaves and call out, stay a while. The light flows from their branches and they call again. It's simple, they say. And you too have come into the world to do this, to go easy, to be filled with light and to shine. And I, I think she brings in that importance of when we aren't feeling that way, <laughs> you know, when we aren't feeling any of our goodness or we don't feel the discernment from the Vipassana practice, the mindfulness, or, or that we don't remember. I don't, I don't think you could say in modern life that we would maybe never walk <laughs> slowly, but I think it's uh, inspiring to try to walk slowly sometimes and, and to bow, to bow often. And, um, I find that in my daily practice, I tend to take a walk before I do a, a sitting. And when I take a walk, I really work at just like I take time to just be aware of seeing. And then just take time to be aware of hearing and take time to be aware of the body sensations in my body and then the bottom of my feet and then knowing, the mind knowing. And within that, uh, it, depending on the day, I feel it's, it's very important that I cultivate a relationship with everything, like a relationship with the sky, a relationship with the trees, a relationship with the sun, a relationship with the ants, a relationship with everything and a relationship with my body sensations and and at first it can start conceptually because we're very much in a conceptual world so i work with that i work with receiving the sun first the word it's a, a relationship it's a dualistic relationship it's conceptual but as the the seeing happens and i slow down and i receive the sensations in my body and the sun it, it becomes non-dual, right? There's no sun, there's no me. There's just the direct experience of warmth or the textures of, um, <laughs> you know, those textures of the movement of even the sweating or however, however you know, the bottom of my feet and the heaviness. And it's just uh, shifting to the relationship with earth, but directly relationship with air, water, um, fire that that it shifts right but I don't start there necessarily but the the idea is to uh, renew 
every day the strength of these relationships. Very, very important. And it, it actually, if you, if we do this, even not every day, but I try to do this a lot, uh, then I'm ready for things are as they are. Because there's a hole, there's a eight, not a O H O L E, but W H O L E. There's a wholeness of loving kindness of metta Brahma Vihara that, um, it's restorative, it's renewed, but most important, being ready for things as they are, being ready for the truth of how things are, that uh, <clears throat> requires the strength of metta. It requires the strength of, of these relationships. <clears throat> and I'm not saying uh, I feel like I'm accomplished in that. I'm saying that I do this every day to cultivate these relationships, these friendships. I think we can often think that, oh, well, I'll do that even for a couple of years and then it should be over, but it isn't. It, it, um, today, the moon is in a very different place than it was yesterday. <clears throat> So shifting, as Steve shifted us to the pleasant, unpleasant, neutral, it's like shifting to things as they are will include the vicissitudes of life. Is that better? Can you hear me okay? Try that. I'm sorry. I'm not Lower? No, no. Higher. Well, you must have the mic perfect. Okay, just leave it like that. That's How's that? Is that good? Okay. Um, so we can see that when the heart, the mind, the chitta, the knowing mind, the heart is uh, resisting things as they are, it's um, so painful. When we think of the phrase, may you be happy and peaceful of heart, or may you be free from suffering, it's often I, I am wishing initially for, for myself or others to be um, shifting from resistance to acceptance. And that often cannot happen without the kindness, without the loving kindness, or as, as Steve brought in the compassion, the mudita. And so learning how to um, appreciate that we really, we really do want to be free from suffering. We, we really do want to be happy and peaceful of heart. And when you know that about yourself, you will want that for everyone, every being, whether it's a, a chipmunk or a shark or a human being of a belief that you are not into or belief that you are into any being, um, when you wish that for yourself, you will wish it for all being. It's unconditional. So what distinguishes this Brahma Vihara of metta is that it's love. It's a wishing well, but it's infused with wisdom. It's infused with understanding that we all take birth and the vicissitudes of life. So love infused with wisdom is metta, love infused with understanding. What is the understanding? Well, that we're born into a world of joy and sorrow, of gain and loss, of praise and blame, and fame and disrepute, that, that it's, it's easy to love. And we kind of started to talk about that at the end of the um, question periods last time. Just it's uh, easy to love ourselves or others when we like what, what's going on and what we're doing. But if we make a mistake, then how do we relate to ourselves? Or if somebody else makes a mistake, then how do we relate to them or et cetera? Just the, the breadth and depth of the uh, joy and sorrow in this world. So it requires these layers of protection. And of course, resistance is not something bad or wrong. The, the not accepting 
is a defense. It protects the heart. But it's also very painful because we're not connected with how things are. So another metaphor that has come into my world, including the little gold lay of stars that to me are like the Brahma Viharas, they, they surround our heart, they surround our body, they protect us. Uh, also the Mamani flowers that, that circle the mountain. And then there's, um, I saw a video of this um, Ethiopian, Orthodox Church in Ethiopia and started to learn more and read more about it. And um, it said that for a church to be a church, it has to be enveloped by a forest. And, you know, from that fifth century tradition in the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. And if, if you looked at Google Earth nowadays in Ethiopia, it's similar to the big island Mount Achaea. It's like the decimation of the forest is so profound from agriculture and cattle grazing. But most of the churches have still tried to maintain some, some lay like a forest around the church because the forest is considered to be integral to the church, but the, it's getting smaller and smaller. So there's this um, wonderful man, Dr. <clears throat> Alam Ahiu Wasi, who has, is spending his whole life trying to talk the um, priests and communities into opening up the walls around the churches to include more forests. And then he's worked with in some place since uh, 2002, and they've knocked down the wall that they built, and they're building another wall that's uh, bigger around it. And there's a saying that every time a person plants a tree, that every time the wind blows through that tree, that it prays for that person. Doesn't that make you want to plant a tree? You know, just like, to me, it's like planting metta, but it's like grasping, grasping again, metta includes our relationship with the sky, the forest, the plants. It's not just about us or humans. And to, to get a sense of a, the vision of that, the, um, the vision that, you know, for Steve and Jesse, we, we saw this video and we're like, yes, that's what we want to do on the land on the Big Island. It's like to, to just uh, include that whole, the wholeness of it. So um, in this old tradition, the priest, the priest's duty is to protect the forests. Why? And we might say, oh, well, there's medicine in the forest, or it's um, the pollinators are in the forest. Uh, or the, it protects all the beings in the forest. But in the old days, they would say it was to protect the hermits. So the hermits were different than the priests. And the hermits were called tree dwellers. And their, their duty was to pray for everyone. That's just what they did. And there's still some left, but there's so few forests left, right? And it's like to grasp again that when I go into Burma and I meet some of these beings that they just spend their life doing loving kindness or they spend their life 
doing vipassana and they're they they are saints like it's like the fragrance of it i know it's just like again i would get down on my knees and weep that that's possible that we are capable of that and that that is still protected and here it is again a different different um, tradition but this understanding of the importance that the, the, the goal of some of these hermits is to become invisible. Very few can do that. They have to be, they, it's, you know, the different languaging, but it's that you have to be so holy to become invisible. But yes, there are beings there that are just praying for our, our well-being. So um, a way to try to hold that is that our metta, anytime we practice metta, that, that wish, that prayer, that um, wishing well is part of the forest, right? It's like the, this is not like a tree isn't a separate entity. It's a, it's a process of interactions like Steve described in the meditation. It's like it's momentary, it's, but it's all connected. It's intertwined. So we have this understanding of anatta that nothing exists by itself. And that the, the, the forest is a metaphor, like the protection of the forest is a metaphor for what I started with, which is we protect our relationships. We protect our relationship to ourself. That's with the mindfulness and the, the Brahma Viharas. That's the lay of flowers. And all these um, metaphors are meant to inspire us to get stronger with this, to inspire us to try a little more, as Mary Oliver said, to just, oh, maybe I can walk a little slower sometimes, or maybe I can bow more. Maybe the forest says, stay a little longer by this tree and listen to the wind going through it. Somebody planted it. and the wind is blowing through with, with a wishing well. This is so restorative for us, even five seconds of that. This is, um, lastly, I mean, I could go into this more, but in terms of the forests and the hermits in Ethiopia, The hermits were considered, because they were praying for everybody's well-being, that they were considered a protection. So, you know, it's like to know that every time you're, you're practicing loving kindness, um, vipassana, it's like you're bringing in a, an energy of protection into this world. The historian Benedicta Ward said of the hermits, in the desert, this is in the fourth century Egypt. Um, the monks were like trees purifying the atmosphere by their presence. And so, you know, we, we have to see that however a language works for us, that, that is, and when we heard the instruction to check out the difference between being attached to pleasure and just being with it. And knowing that that just being with it is very different. It's just like this, it's like purifying the atmosphere in those seconds. It's a protection. When we say, may I or you or we, may we be safe and protected from inner and outer harm. It's like, what are we being protected from? aversion and attachment.
So we find our way, we navigate, hopefully with this um, understanding of the protection of kindness and the understanding that the aversion and the attachment, this pushing away of the pain with aversion or fear, like this not accepting the pain in the world or the holding on to the pleasure in the world, um, that they're just attempts at protection. They're not wrong or bad. It's like when it's like we have to be very careful. How interested are we in aversion? In our own aversion or in our own attachment. This is the key. It's like that's when you start smelling this fragrance of freedom when you have these moments of interest in, oh, what is this? You know, can I can I be with this um, defense? this attempt at protection. And when we can go, ah, ha, 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 aversion, and then to be able to just be with it. It's like a, I had a, a karma, I have the karma of migraines. Haven't had one for a while and had one yesterday, have a remnant of it today. And it's like, um, when I bring my attention to that, part of my body where the migraine is, it's usually there's like, ugh, right? It's like, ugh, you know, that just, it's really tight. Just, it's so tight. Um, and so there's a word I could say, oh, that's really painful. But that doesn't tell you anything. It's just a word, right, pain. But I could, if I go into it and just say, wow, this is like a tightness that is so hard to be with. And so a lot of times I bring my attention when I'm giving this talk, mostly my attention is with the bottom of my feet and my heart center, the bottom of my feet, heart center. I'm not, I don't have my attention deep into that tightness while I'm giving this talk. It would be very unpleasant, right? <laughs> like it, it would be not helpful. Um, so, so, the practice doesn't necessarily mean that when something, when we say joy and sorrow, pleasure and pain, it's like it's an art to be able to, to have the kindness and the understanding to know moment by moment how to really have this um, lay of flowers of, prote of protection. Uh, but the protection is usually in understanding um, when to bring the attention with kindness close into something, when to bring the attention uh, in a very macroscopic view, and when to bring the attention um, to something else. Not out of aversion, but out of kindness. Watch the time. That might be good. So it's, it's, I might add one more thing into that, which is that um, we talk a lot. I think a very popular word nowadays is connection. It's like connect the attention, connect the attention. Um, but if, when we talk about moment to moment, sixth sense door awareness, uh, the idea is also connecting with the movement of life, with the change of life, with as much kindness as we can, but also it's a process of not controlling it. And so I'm giving you an example of the migraine, which is so important. I'm not trying to control that. I'm just trying to live with it and, you know, watch it get intense, get less intense, move the attention away, move the attention close just to, to be with it, right? It's like, but the attempt isn't to get rid of it, to, um, um, <laughs> you know, investigate it, to manipulate it or fix it. It's just, it's like finding the, the place to navigate along with it. And I understand that it's impermanent. 
it will pass, right? And so understanding that with everything, when something's, um, for me, uh, whenever I get to go up into the mountains, which is very rare, and up there with the, um, Davis, I find it hard to leave. It's, it's like a, a homeland. It's very um, powerful for me. And it's hard to leave. But it's just like, um, it's, I'm giving you a different example. It's like the migraine is intensely painful up in the mountains. It's so um, pleasurable for me. Uh, and it, it's, intense, it's, it's as intensely pleasurable as it's intensely painful with the migraine. And the, it's the same kind of process where it's like, oh, time to go, you know, and just uh, appreciating that I could be there. So instead of holding on, just like, oh, just shifting into the gratitude. And the gratitude for these beings who are trying to conserve this place, just, um, oh. These trees aren't that big, but they're protected and they're growing. And these, again, there's, it's so important to see these things as metaphors. It's like anywhere where there's conservation and conserving. When you conserve 10 minutes for some loving kindness, it's the same as having a um, piece of land that you're trying to conserve a tree or a bird. It's, it's, um, we're all, we all have so much, um, depth of understanding and Brahma Vihara to practice. And we don't have to think of how big the tree is. It's like that thought of like the wind passing through the tree as being that prayer for us all is, um, is the wisdom, is the understanding of what we're doing. So we, may we appreciate the role of the, uh, the beings that just practice metta or vipassana all the time, the beings that are out in the front lines, hardly getting to practice. Um, in that way, but are bringing as much kindness and understanding as they can into what they're doing in this world where it's important as well. It's like we all have our place in it. I think most of us are trying to do a bit of it all. <laughs> okay, time for questions. Thank you, Michelle. Um, so yeah, as, as normal, we have some time for questions. If anyone has any um, about your practice, about the talk, about the instructions, um, anything that's come up for you, I'll sort of take the lead on it. But if you have a question specifically about Michelle's talk or Stephen's instructions, of course, you can ask to, um, any of us in particular. Uh, because we can't really see everyone visually at the same time, if you have a question, it'd be best to um, correct me if I'm wrong, because as the host, I don't have all the things. If you click on the participants thing on the bottom, uh, over on the right hand side, there should be a little hand there where you can raise your hand and then I can see here whose hands are raised uh, for a question. Um, and we'll sort of take it from there. If that doesn't seem to be working, you can just kind of write up a little note to, to me in the chat to say that you've got a question. I'll put you in the queue.
Um, so Nicole, looks like you have a question. Are you, let's see. Can you Can unmute you? yourself there? Yeah. Yeah, hi. 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 Um, my question uh, is about doing meta for someone who has passed. Um, my, um, I don't remember how to describe it, but my gentle being or the person that I would go to um, first uh, has passed recently. And obviously I'm grieving, but I'm also just wondering, uh, I would love to hear your thoughts on um, sending meta to the souls of loved ones who have passed and just, yeah, <laughs> that's the question. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry to hear that. It's, of course, it's hard on anyone we care about. <laughs> or sometimes people we don't know we care about pass away, but when they're actually someone that you use for the practice in this particular way, it has its own, I think, particular challenges. Um, you know, I'll be curious to hear what Steve and Michelle have to say. You know, there's a range of, um, there's a range of possibility, I think, that we would all kind of encourage. And mostly it's going to sort of, de I think in the end, it's ultimately going to come down to your own experimenting and what works, right? Um, I think that you, you, you pointed out the, the basic dilemma, the basic challenge of practicing, of trying to find and connect and sustain a, um, a relationship with the tenderness and the well-wishing and the, 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 as Steve was kind of laying out, the, the beautiful feeling of that with someone who, who there's currently a lot of grief associated with it, right? It, it could be the same if it was someone who there was a lot of anger with or a lot of, uh, you know, desire for. It's like the sense of like, because there is a process that you're in the midst of where there's a range of kind of understandable emotions that are arising, it is going to be, it is going to tend to be particularly challenging to just find our way to the loving kindness and the care. And um, so there's the level of like, where do we have to sort of navigate the relationship between that care and and sadness and grief and you know whatever unresolved pieces of relationship might be there loss of you know future hopes the sort of like the whole the whole package of what we go through when when we've lost someone that we care deeply about um, and whether it feels helpful whether it's possible to connect with just the loving kindness, whether it feels helpful to just connect with the loving kindness or not, um, are sort of two, I think, just places to keep exploring, right? So there might be times where the grief is not the predominant thing and you are really mostly in that sense of appreciation of their goodness and of the relationship you had and the beauty of their character or their actions or what have you. And so that sense of just like natural connection with your appreciation of their goodness, uh, of your love for them, you know, if that arises, there's gonna, no one is gonna ever say like, oh, don't, <laughs> don't, don't, don't do that, you know? It's like, it's beautiful. It's beautiful if you can find some place of connection with that, especially amid the grief and the kind of heartache that might be there. Um, you don't want to, you want to be careful to not be trying to find love and that connection to, you know, appreciation and care and all of these things as a way of not feeling the pain, right? As a way of necessarily like avoiding the grief that might also be there. And, and sort of, it's kind of part of that dance of like, well, where is the relationship uh, between these heart building practices and the Vipassana practice of just being with what is and the reality of the reality of reality and the reality of our response to reality, which is another layer of reality and, and that sort of being with it. You will see in the classical texts that the people are generally dis dissuaded from practicing loving kindness for, um, for someone who's just passed away, for someone we're in an intimate relationship with. There's sort of like a range of, of people, mostly because of these kind of the pitfalls of where you can sort of just start to slide into despair or wanting or grasping. 
but most of those instructions are also really focused on the, the practicing of these Brahma Viharas as deep concentration practices. So the idea is like, you're probably not gonna enter like a completely absorptive experience of loving kindness with this other thing going on. Um, but at the same time, it doesn't mean it's not. So, so if, if you're not worried about like, you know, getting absorbed into the experience in these sort of very technical ways, that's like, yeah, it can be a wonderful part of like your grieving process. And I'll say for myself, it has been, and I assume for Michelle and Steven also, and you can hear from them of like, that that for me, it's it's been like super important to be able to both feel the like weight of the loss and the pain and the whatever agony might be there and to not fight it and not resist it and, and listen to it and, and feel it fully. Um, and then because we are able to ride those waves when they dissipate, that sometimes there really is this access to just like, oh, total love and total appreciation. And that you can actually, if, if we allow for the pain and the loss that we might actually have more access for the love as well. Those things aren't, um, contradictory, you know, and that um, to let yourself feel that, to let yourself go into those spaces, if it feels there and it feels natural, I think it'd be a, like a super important part. Um, yeah, I don't know, Michelle and Steve, do you have anything you want to add? I've, yeah, no. I mean, Michelle, you're muted there. I think that's where the um, you could shift of a, a compassion for yourself, and then um, shift to equanimity, where you're accepting that the death happened. You know, like that you don't have to stay with the meta necessarily. I think it's a um, a question that we all have had to face, and um, I would try to be flexible with it like and not have a time frame you know if it if it starts flooding and just stop and shift to something else the the, the compassion and equanimity are really important with this with the death yeah, just to emphasize that equanimity, you know, Michelle mentioned last week that there's a, a friend of ours who's only 36 who passed away a few weeks ago. And um, that's like this built in, it's this, it's this intuition and this kind of um, groove. I, I think that it's easy to it, over time build of like, oh, automatically just sending metta to this person, wherever they are, whatever the sort of condition and state that that comes after this for any individual, the sense that they're still available, actually, to be able to, to have a relationship with. And in fact, in non physically, there is sometimes a real sense that you can actually, whatever distance might have been there between you physically, isn't relevant anymore that actually people might be quite quite available on some level of relationship for a period of time and and that the loving kindness is important but also the equanimity is important and that i think there's that sense of like really feeling that it might be of benefit to them as well right that it's it's for your own grieving process it's for your own heart and the strengthening of it and the softening of it but that this sense of whatever happens after this body dies and whatever's next, it seems that there's likely that it can be a little confusing uh, for people, for anyone. And, and, that, and that that sense of caring and the sense of peace uh, can be of a very tangible support and very real support to, to beings in their journey, I think is something that is worth at least holding the possibility of and feeling that sense of like, whether wh whoever it's good for you or that person or the place where it do those, those distinguishments don't matter anymore. Um, it's just going to be really helpful. I, mean, I might just add that, you know, in the, in the tradition, there is also a really um, long-standing practice of sharing the merit of, of good deeds or of your practice with someone who's passed away. And so that ends up being, while there is like not a lot of formal 
loving kindness or compassion or um, appreciative joy or equanimity done directly with the people who have just passed away. Um, there is a very profound practice of sharing the merit of this sense that somehow whatever goodness you generate through your actions, through your practice um, can be um, offered you know, whether, whatever metaphysical way we believe that's possible or not, the, the intention of the heart to do that, the intention to honor someone with our goodness and to, to have our, our own goodness and our own beautiful actions um, be sponsored by supported and inspired by someone else and, and our well wishing for them is something that's um, very much encouraged and practiced um, throughout you know, the, this tradition and these traditions. And it might also be something that you can kind of do, you know, it could be at the end of a sitting practice or even just at the end of a day, you know, these days of being like, oh, whatever good deeds I've done today, it's like, may it, may it go towards supporting, you know, this person on their journey. May it go towards their happiness and their well being. And at the very least, there is a good quality that that develops in our own hearts and, um, and may be of support of them as well. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Good luck with it. Yeah. Looks like uh, Molly, do you have a question there? Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um. I've been want like trying to put words on this question for a while, but it just boils down to how do you practice with delusion? I feel like I've really experienced the subtleties of wanting and aversion, and I have categorized myself as an aversive person and kind of went through that and went, no, you know what? I think I think I'm clingy, and now I'm really into delusion. And lost, confused about delusion. <laughs> and well, I'm very indecisive as a person. And I, I wonder if being indecisive is not delusional, actually. You know, like just being able to hold the uh, of, of multiple perspectives. But anyway, I'm... I would love it if you guys have something you want to riff on that with, because I I'll take anything right now. Yeah. <laughs> That's so great. That's such a, it's like, I think there's something al so ultimately important about that question, you know, and and even just your process, I think is something that we all go through. I mean, you, you think about, you know, there's often this sort of framework or that we're we're a certain type, we're more of a greedy type or an aversive type or deluded type, and to whatever degree that's true, we have all of them. And that I think it is a, a, in our maturing practice, it's like we go through these first more, like as Michelle, in Michelle, the way Michelle was framing it, our, our most immediate defenses to the instability of life and the uncertainty of things. And so some of ours may be more aversive as like our, our initial def line of defense is like, oh, I'm not liking stress, anxiety, you know, the kind of like whatever the range, you know, fear of anger, the, the whole spectrum of that can look like. And then, you know, as you sort of get into that piece of like, oh yeah, this is really a deep conditioning of mine to how I relate to stress is this kind of tightening in an againstness. And then starting to see this like, oh yeah, and there's like this wanting, this craving, this pleasure of yourself where you're like, oh, you just want, you want to stabilize the pleasant and you want, you want what's good to make you feel better because things are out of control, you know? And mm -hmm. then to get to this place of like, oh, well, there's actually something else that's much harder to see. It's much less clear. And it's like the nature of delusion is that it's hard to see, right? It's impossible. It's like, to, how do you bring wisdom to delusion, right? How do you bring seeing to delusion? And I think, you know, we'll see what, what they have to say too, but I think you're doing it. I mean, that's exactly right, which is the indecisiveness is a perfect place to start to see this kind of play out and just check it out and just be curious, right? Like that it's like, you don't know, you're not necessarily going to be have this moment of like, oh, I'm seeing delusion because it's sort of, it's like when you see it, it's gone. It's sort of part of the nature of it, right? Um, but what you are seeing as 
delusion as a defense, the same as greed, the same as hatred. It's when things are overwhelming, when we're not sure which thing we want more or which thing we want less or which thing is the priority or there's a, there's a way that the attention can build up in the mind, a stress and anxiety, a, there's an instability there. And one of the defenses of the mind is gonna be the, the many tools of delusion, confusion, indecision, spacing out, just, for, more aversion uh, i get averse to the delusion so then i go oh there. yeah you, they pile on <laughs> so you know um I, I i mostly think it's just like just just keep doing what you're doing don't you don't need to it's like that you have this sort of sense of this flavor of the mind and a certain kind of peculiar way that is more subtle right that is harder to see is just great and you just keep doing it, keep looking at it, like, oh, right. And, and but the, the way that that can help is like, the, often we start to see that the, we, we get frustrated with the indecision, but you can sometimes be like, it doesn't matter. You could do this one or do this one. You know, you, you can order this one or that one or whatever. Like, actually the choice isn't really the problem. It's like, that doesn't matter. The problem, the, the, the stress is, is, what you, is what we can focus on. It's like, oh, where is there discomfort? Where is there a sense of inability to be with the instability? And that is the much more interesting place than, oh, well, this is the right decision or that's the right decision. It's like, oh, how, do I, how am I with this discomfort of not knowing, with the instability, with the insecurity? And if you are more of an aversive type, the delusion, and I'll can say speaking from experience, is like the, the like the least part you're gonna want to see, right? Because I, I I am definitely an aversive type, strongest, and part of the good side of all of these have good sides. The aversive type will tend to be very clear, um, and so when the aversive type is not clear, it's not comfortable like that feels like really, really uncomfortable. And so for the aversive type, it's like the delusion is like the worst thing to have to kind of feel. So it's just like, you also wanna give yourself some patience with that, you know? The greedy type tends to have a lot of access to love and kindness and connection and joy, you know? And that's like a real beautiful quality. The deluded type will, when not, when the confusion isn't there, you know, there's gonna be more access to sort of, you know, equanimity and some, some basic okayness and some neutrality, you know? Um, which is a, a, a often a very balancing thing that gets brought into relationships or into groups. Um, so, you know, know that they all have their sort of positive sides, um, but that you can, yeah, keep doing what you're doing to check it out. Thanks. Yeah. I don't, do you all have any, uh, Michelle, Steve, anything you want to add to those? Uh, Steve, let me, I have to unmute there. There you go. Just quickly, Molly, um, to frame it as for practice purposes, if you take the five hindrances of um, attachment, aversion, sleepiness, restlessness, and um, doubt, um, attachment and aversion relate to the two unhealthy psychological conditions of, of um, uh, greed and hatred. The remaining three, sleepiness, restlessness, doubt, are all rooted in the unhealthy psychological uh, root of delusion. So sleepiness comes out of delusion, restlessness comes out of delusion, and, and doubt, which is characterized as a chronic indecisiveness. Mm. It's also based in delusion. So it just gives a handle on uh, how to practically work with it, like what's coming up in the moment, rather than just your thoughts about, well, I used to be the aversive type, and now I seem to be the deluded type. That might not get you into the um, feeling the, the viscerally feeling the weight of delusion, which is hard because as Jesse said, delusion works really well in deluding us that we're connecting with anything. Yeah. It'll bring up doubt about that. It'll bring up uh, the defense of sleepiness. It'll make you restless. So you just want to connect with what is there, what you are feeling. Mm -hmm. Go to the body. 
Thank you. Any more, any more questions today? All right, well, it's been wonderful to be with you all again this week. Mm. I think there's a meteor shower coming up here at the Perseid. Maybe it's on the, I think it's usually like the 11th and 12th or something. So uh, if you can get a dark sky. And a clear sky, <laughs> if we ever get sky. a clear sky. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's, sometimes it can be helpful to relate to those. It's like we relate to our thoughts as like these huge problems, you know, and they're just sort of streaming by and um, we never relate to the a shooting star that way. But sometimes it's, you know, can you relate to your own mind as just this sort of incredible sky of shooting stars? Um, sometimes it's helpful to actually see them to to take in that possibility. So uh, be well and take care and hopefully we'll see you again next weekend. Yeah. Aloha. Good to see you all. <laughs> Have a good week. Hmm.